Now we've got this, right? We did this. We have one service calling two services and returning a response. What are we doing wrong with this whole thing that we're doing? What are some of the things we are doing wrong? Hard coding, hard coding the URL is one thing. Well, okay, we talk about why hard coding URLs are bad. Changes require code updates. That's the first thing. Pretty obvious there. When you deploy something to the cloud, uh, you get dynamic URLs. Right? So let's say you push this thing to uh, an AWS instance. You have no idea what that URL is going to be, or you push it to Heroku. You have no idea, and it changes. So you need to accommodate the change. You have no idea what that URL is going to be. You also need to do load balancing. One of the advantages of microservices are, I'd say you have one microservice, which, is, which has a lot of demand. So we can spin up two or three of those, right? Each one of those, if you do, is going to have its own URL. So even if you were to say, OK, I'm happy to live with hard-coded URLs, now you have three URLs. Which one are you going to hard-code? Right? You need some mechanism to load balance. And then um, the final thing that I've listed here, uh, among multiple other drawbacks that I haven't listed, is you have multiple environments. When you're developing the URL as localhost, when you deploy it into a QA environment, it's going to be QA slash whatever. And then in production, it's going to be a different URL. So you need something that is aware of which environment it's running in, and based on that, make that call. You don't want to be writing a lot of code or configuration to make that happen. If QA do this is very, very bad, you shouldn't be doing that. Right? So because of all these reasons, we have service discovery. This is another one of those patterns. When you build microservices, you need them to talk to each other. How do they know what to talk to? They discover what that is. They discover the target. right? So how do you do service discovery? So let's say you have one client, which is our movie catalog service, and you have three other services that it needs to consume. right? One of those three it needs to consume. How does it locate something? How can it discover something? What's the minimum thing you need to have to enable service discovery? What would be the first step? Let's say you're doing this yourself, right? Let's say you're implementing a service discovery uh, pattern yourself. You're writing all the code from the scratch. What would you do? I say that again. You. URLs, yeah, you have to register all the URLs, right? You have to save it somewhere. Exactly. You have to provide a layer of abstraction. You have to provide something in between, which is in charge of what those services are, right? This guy in the middle knows where the services are. And what the client does is it calls that guy and says, OK, I'm, I'm looking for the service. Give me the URL. And then it's going to give you the URL, and then you call that service. It begs the question, how does it discover this service? How does it discover the, the server which provides the URL? Does that make sense? You, you change the problem. You provide a layer of abstraction, but then how does it discover that thing in the first place? We can hold that discussion in a little bit, but let's assume somehow it knows. OK? Now, what happens? You start that server. And then each of those services which wants to be discovered registers with that discovery server. Right? It says, OK, I'm here. Somebody needs me. Just let them know I'm here. Right? Kind of like a phone book. So this guy is maintaining a phone book. And then all these people are kind of providing those entries into the phone book. Whoever needs to make a call looks up the phone book and gets the address. So once it's registered, it's all good to go. The discovery server knows where those services are. The client talks to the discovery server, and it tells what service it needs. It says, OK, I want service two. The discovery server says, sure, here it is. It provides the address. It provides the link to where that service is. And then the client knows where it is, and then it makes a call. Right? The disadvantage here should be obvious. It's a little bit chatty. Rather than having it make the call directly, there is an additional step that needs to happen to discover it. So there is a hop, a response, and then the actual API call. 
there are ways to mitigate that and be covering that in a bit, but it's obvious that that is the disadvantage. This model we saw in the previous slide is what's called client-side discovery. Who's doing all the work to discover the server? It's the client, right? It says, okay, I'm gonna call the, I'm gonna look up the phone book, get the information and then make a call. All that work is happening on the client side. So this model is one of two models for service discovery. This is called the client side service discovery. There's an alternative model. Can you guess what that is? Server side service discovery. That's the alternative where you do all those things on the server. Here's how it works. You still have a discovery server. It's still, you still have the phone book. It has a registry and everybody registers to that discovery server. But here's where the things, here's where things get a little bit different. The client says, the client doesn't give me the address of service two. It says, tell service two, this is my message. All right? It doesn't try to contact service two directly. It calls the discovery server. Technically, this is not a discovery server anymore. It's kind of like a something on the server which is in charge of passing the message to the right server. I should probably change this. It's not discovery server. It's not helping in discovery. So a client says, pass this message to service two. And then the discovery server does the job of passing that message. What's the advantage here? No extra hops, right? It's more efficient this way. So this is uh, server side service discovery. Both models are very much valid. Each one has its own advantage and disadvantage. Uh, the model that Spring Cloud uses is client-side service discovery. Okay, when you create an application using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, and then you say, I want to use service discovery, the libraries that facilitate service discovery will reside on the client. That's not to say that there isn't something in the middle. You need that level of abstraction. You need a discovery server. That's a given. That's not happening on the client. There, is, there has to be a separate server which facilitates this. But then the work involved in calling that discovery server, getting the information about where to call, and then making the actual call happens on the client. Make sense? Any questions about this so far? Yes and yes. In fact, the way it works with Spring Cloud is you don't have to do any of this stuff. You just have to put configuration and then everything happens behind the scenes. It's almost scary how much of this works as magic. You, um, there's one thing to complain about, okay, there's too much work. With Spring, what I feel happens is there's too much work that Spring is doing. I feel like I've, I don't have control over things. It's like they've dialed it up to the other extreme. But you do have control. You can you can do all this stuff yourself. You can you have an API to call discovery server, get a list of services, parse through it, and make another call. But you don't have to do this. Spring handles all of that for you. Spring also handles caching, and you can turn that off by default. But yeah, it's it's possible. But then, the model itself is client-side service discovery. 